And this week in Iowa runoff elections across the state, we sit down with a historic winner. And non-religious voters are becoming more common, how they're being targeted by campaigns, then a talk on tariffs, the trade war in Japan, plus some big shakeups as candidates drop out of the race. Hi everyone and thank you so much for joining us here on This Week in Iowa. I'm Sabrina Ahmed. We start this morning off with the runoff election results from Tuesday night. History was made in a few races and we are tracking four races in the area. Des Moines longest serving mayor wins his fifth term in office. Frank County narrowly defeating uh, former state senator Jack Hatch. Unofficial results have him winning by less than 300 votes. There were also two city council seats up for election in Des Moines. In Ward 2, Linda Westergaard wins re-election over Skipmore, 58 to 42 percent. And for the at-large seat, Carl Voss wins over Jackie Easley, 56 to 44 percent. Finally, in Ames, history was made. 20-year-old Iowa State student Rachel Junk became the youngest woman ever elected to public office in Ames, the second youngest woman in Iowa, beating incumbent Chris Nelson for Ames' fourth ward. And now we are joined by Rachel Junk. So, first of all, Rachel, congratulations. Thank you so Give much. Give us your story. Yeah, so I was born and raised in Ames and loved it so much I decided to go to college at Iowa State as well. And what I found was that students at Iowa State weren't being represented on our city council. And that's why I decided to run for office, was really having that background in Ames, but also the perspective of a student to bring both to the council. Okay, so what was, what was the process like to start running for city council and you know how did you feel like you were being received in the beginning and toward the end in that last final push? Yeah the first step was definitely assembling my campaign team that would help me. Um, I wanted to make that 50% students and 50% community members so we could be sure we're reaching out to everyone in Ames and that was kind of how I got started. This summer I started knocking doors and a lot of people were skeptical about if it was possible for a 20 year old student especially in chemical engineering to balance <laughs> that with school but but especially after the results of the November 5th election, a lot of people um, knew that I was a legitimate candidate and had been putting in the work to reach out to all voters in Ames. Okay, so then you found out in November that it was going to a runoff. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised? Um, I was never surprised. It was always a possibility with three candidates in the race, um, but I was very excited to get 49.5% of the vote that first time. That was such a high number of support, and then to have an even higher voter turnout for the runoff election with only this one race was incredible. So what do you think that people to the polls. What do you think made people vote for you? Um, I think it was the excitement for a lot of students voting for the first time in a local government election that the candidate looked like them and will advocate for their needs and aims as well as the rest of the community. A lot of other community members I've been talking to about issues that I wanted to act on, quality of life, affordable housing, and local climate action. And all of those really resonated with the population of Ames and that's what they voted me into office to work on. Okay, so at 20, your life experience is not nearly what it is, you know, after you've graduated from college, yeah. after you've maybe bought a house or, mm -hmm. um, you know, had a full-time job and had to pay bills and all those yeah. things. So what do you bring to the table that's different? Um, I would say growing up in Ames, I experienced a lot of different things in our community and also having the perspective of a younger student when half of the population of Ames' students is a valuable perspective to bring to the council with a vote. Okay, so do you ever fear not being taken seriously on the city council? Um, I do fear that a little bit, but I'm excited to get to work and start putting my plans and vision for the future of Ames into action, and I think that'll be taken pretty seriously. How have you been received since winning the election? It's kind of been a whirlwind for you, I'm sure. Yeah, it's been a very exciting 48 hours. Um, I've been shown so much support by the whole community and people all across the country, too, so that has been amazing. All across the country? What do you mean? Yeah, um, uh, several presidential candidates shouted me out, and, and a lot of different news outlets have been covering the story as well, so it was kind of cool to share the history that's being made in Iowa. Okay, so that brings me to my next question. As a 20-year-old elected official, mm -hmm. one would imagine that you probably have your sights set on potentially a little bit of a higher office someday. Are you thinking that long term? Um, I'm not thinking that long term currently. I'm still a student in chemical engineering, <laughs> and that's kind of the field that I'm looking at for the future right now, but we'll see how city council goes. Okay, so chemical engineering, what does that mean? What do you want to do with 
your life? Um, I'm not 100% sure yet. Um, I'm looking at what jobs in the field I might want to do, and um, climate change is definitely a passion of mine, working on making sure we can make changes so that um, our, we're friendlier to our earth and have sustainability initiatives at the local, state, federal level. So what can be done at a local level in the city of Ames by the city council in order to improve climate change? Yeah, so something I think is really important is a climate action plan so we can begin to lower our carbon emissions over the years and um, set a plan for how that will be done. Um, but there's a lot of different initiatives that I'd love to see. Um, expanding bike paths, converting our city transportation fleet to biodiesel um, and other renewable energy, things like that. It was a tight race mm -hmm. and so obviously even though you did win, a good portion of the people who live in Ames voted for the other candidate. So mm -hmm. what's your message to them so that they can support you as well? Yeah, um, Chris Nelson has done a wonderful job in the six years that he's been on council and it was an honor to be in the race with him and I'm very excited to work with all of Ames and represent everyone to um, enact our vision for the future. Okay, Rachel, so if somebody wants to find you, how do they do that? Are you going to hold office hours? I mean, a lot of city council members do that. Yeah, um, throughout the campaign I've been trying to reach people where they're at, whether that's door knocking or phone calls or being on social media and websites for a lot of young people. Um, so I think I'm pretty easily accessible. Okay, awesome. Well, Rachel, congratulations. We are really excited here at This Week in Iowa to watch you as you evolve into a, a politician thank and you so potentially much. a chemical engineer as well. Yeah, thank <laughs> Very you. Very nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Thanks. We'll take a short break, everyone, but coming up next, as we prepare for the caucuses and the general election, there's a religious group that is growing. It's the non-religious. We sit down with an atheist to talk about their place in the presidential election next. Accuracy means tracking the storm. We do a good job of breaking it down and showing people what they can expect. It is so important to not only let you know what's happening at the moment, but to track out what's going to happen in the future. When exactly, at what time is it going to reach your neighborhood? On our We Are Iowa app, we have the greatest interactive radar. If you can't catch our newscast if you're out and about, you can zoom in on the map and know when that storm is going to arrive. We give the information that's needed and we give it accurately. And I think people really appreciate that. Water makes life possible on Earth and in our homes. Culligan conserves this resource with its high-efficiency water softener, the world's best because it uses less water, and that matters to all of us. Click or call Culligan Water and start saving today. While drug companies are making record profits, most Americans live paycheck to paycheck, just one medical emergency away from bankruptcy. I'm Andrew Yang, and I approve this message. As president, I'll fight for mental health coverage and eliminate the loopholes that let drug companies charge too much. They say they need high prices to fund research. The truth? Most FDA-approved drugs rely on research funded by the government. That means you paid for it. The old politics won't tell you that. I just did. The Dish voice remote just got even more powerful. Uh, Why'd we put so much technology in there? You don't think I've watched a lot of football? You want to put a little wager on it? Bet. So you can settle that bet without ever taking your eyes off the game. How many D1 football teams are there? Oh! What you do with that power? Oh, it's gotta hurt. Well, that Woo, is friend. totally up to you. Don't look so sad, man. Come on, we're having fun. New Dish Voice Remote with the Google Assistant. Dish, tuned in to you. Panera's new warm green bowls are full of good. Full of flavor. Color. Full of... Full of good. So you can be too. Oh my God. Try our new warm grain bowls today. Order now on Grubhub. From the capital city, you're watching This Week in Iowa with Sabrina Ahmed. Getting to the heart of what's happening in Iowa politics. Welcome back, everyone. We are joined now by Justin Scott, the state director of American Atheists Iowa. So first of all, Justin, thank you so much for being here. And we're here to talk about atheists and non-religious people in the 2020 election. Mm -hmm. So to get started, how do you identify religiously? Yeah, first off, thanks for having me. Um, I proudly identify as an atheist. I, I don't make any qualms about it. That's who I am. You're wearing a sweatshirt that says, this atheist votes. Absolutely. So I'm very proud of it. What makes you, um, not, not an atheist, but what makes you want to share that so openly? Absolutely. When I first became an atheist or realized I was an atheist, uh, I, I looked around and I learned that atheists are some of the most marginalized people in our society. And yet we are now the single largest voter block in the country. And so given that fact, it's like it's a no-brainer to, to wear it on your sleeve and put it out there to help end the stigma 
about being an atheist in Iowa. So that was going to be my next question. It's not just atheists, though. It's atheists and non-religious people. So if you don't identify with a religion, then you're kind of in that sector, right? Absolutely. Uh, we hear atheist, agnostic, free thinker, skeptic. Whatever the title is, if you're non-religious, if you wake up on a Sunday morning and church is not part of your plan, you would fit under this umbrella. So what role do atheists and non-religious people play in the upcoming election? And, and I would even just say not even just the election, but in our society, they are teachers, they are lawmakers, they are your CEOs, business people, small business owners, there's atheists everywhere. In the election, we're not seeing candidates wear it on their sleeve as much, but we're seeing more voters come out and be willing to talk about their atheism and say, hey, I have a cer certain set of issues that are important to me, why aren't you talking about them? So why do you think that there is this, that people aren't talking about it? Why does that stigma exist? I would like to know, <laughs> that's the million dollar question. We'd like to know why this stigma still exists. Um, one of the things that we know is that for the longest time, there's such a stigma about it that you could lose your job, you can lose relationships with friends and family, you have students that, where their tuition is based on what school they go to, and some that are at a religious college may have their tuition taken from them, from their parents. It's a very unfortunate thing, and we feel like by taking these small steps, being public about it, we can maybe chip away at that. So let's talk about this in the context of 2020. Um, what do non-religious people want out of a candidate? What are they looking for? We're not looking for them to become atheists. Uh, I know there's this fear that people think, well, you just want them to join you. No, it's not about that. It's, it's actually about recognizing, number one, that we exist, recognizing number two that we have issues that are important to us number three recognizing our sheer size and our number even though historically we haven't been part you know in the in the uh, front lines of politics we are here and again it goes back to the stigma but the more we can get candidates to talk about us to recognize that we are here you know we could work together to bridge some of those gaps uh, uh, without getting too in depth we have the religious right that tries to bombard its way into politics, tries to dictate every part of our politics. Um, it'd be nice for us to get some recognition as well. Well, but when you see the religious right and sometimes the people on the left as well, you see people going to extremes. Absolutely. Um, but that's what gets people out to the polls. That's what gets people to vote. It ignites that base. Right. So do non-religious and atheists vote? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's hard because at, when you're doing the polling numbers, the exit polls, it's hard for people to admit to some uh, person doing a survey, hey, are you, I'm an atheist, yes, and I just voted. A lot of times they haven't even admitted to their family or friends that they're an atheist, so coming out publicly after they vote for something is not number one on their priority list. So it's hard to get atheists on record a lot of times because we don't even know where they are. You know, we've got to try to pull them out, and hopefully with this type of activism, more people will say, you know what, I'm an atheist, and no big deal. So would you say that there are specific issues that atheists or non-religious people have in mind when they are heading to the polls, or are you just, you know, it's all across the uh, spectrum as well, it just it is a matter of being religious or not religious. Yeah, it's a lot of that. We're not a monolithic group, mm -hmm. so we don't follow the same things all across the board. But for the most part, I would argue that a lot of us feel that a person's bodily autonomy is very important. Giving people the right to make decisions for themselves, for their bodies, for their health care, that is crucial to who we are. Um, having a government that doesn't utilize one religious persuasion to make laws, that's so important to all of us. E even the conservative atheists that I'm friends with will argue it's important that we have a government that's free from that. We don't want the state house turning into a revival. That's not the point. The point is to represent all Iowans. Justin Scott, thank you so yeah, much. What a fascinating conversation. We appreciate Absolutely, you. Absolutely, thank right, you. We'll take a short break, but coming up next, we switch gears to talk trade and the most recent comments from President Trump on China, plus a new trade deal is inked. Stick with us. The Brass Armadillo off I-8035 between the 14th Street and 2nd Avenue exits with hundreds of dealers and millions of antiques is the perfect place for all of your holiday shopping needs. The friendly staff will help you find everything on your holiday shopping list. Can't decide? Pick up Brass Armadillo gift cards. Happy holidays from the Brass Armadillo. Open from 9 to 9 every day off I-8035 between the 14th Street and 2nd Avenue exits. We got everybody talking.
to be commander in chief of the United States. It's a sacred duty. The next president is going to face enormous challenges in picking up the pieces of American foreign policy. We're going to need a leader who can, on day one, stand with our allies, know them by their first names, and have them know there'll be no question about the word of the next president of the United States. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. Instead of going to school every morning, what if school could come to you? Because learning happens anywhere and everywhere. K-12 powered schools provide a tuition-free, full-time, online public school education. It's public school at home. K-12's curriculum is designed to engage students, to challenge them. So visit k12.com today. Tuition-free in Iowa. No matter what you do, you're always raising the bar. Delaro fungicide for corn and soybeans can help you get the edge you're looking for. Delaro has a broader spectrum of disease control and best-in-class dual mode of action residual. Plus, it improves health, so your top-performing hybrids and varieties will have the protection they need to help you achieve your personal best yields. Delaro fungicide from Bayer. Keep raising the bar. You're watching This Week in Iowa, Sunday morning talk focused on the political scene in Iowa. I have no deadline, no. In some ways, I think it's better to wait till after the election. This week at the NATO summit in London, President Donald Trump saying he might wait until after the election to make a deal with China on the trade war. Trump also saying he'd be able to come up with a better deal and that he would be able to do it himself. So joining me now is Randy Miller, a soybean and corn farmer from Lacona, Iowa, also a member of the board of the Iowa Soybean Association. Randy, thank you so much for being here. Yes, Welcome Brina. to This Week in Iowa. Thank you. Okay, so... Randy, what's happening? What is going on with the trade war? What are you hearing as a member of the Soybean Association, as uh, a corn farmer as well, someone with your ear to the ground? What's going on? Uh, President Trump's working on it. I think they're negotiating things every day. It's a slow process with China to get everything worked out. I would like to see it done sooner rather than later. How do you respond when you hear the president say, maybe it won't happen until after the election? There's a lot of rhetoric in Washington. Is he, is that a play to get China to, to move or not move? I don't know. I would rather he was more optimistic that it was going to get done. So how do you feel like you're doing with uh, not only your soybeans but your corn? And um, how, do you feel like you have markets for what you're growing and harvesting right now? There are markets, but when you don't have a deal worked out with China and they take one in every three rows of soybeans, that's a huge market to not have mm -hmm. or potentially not have. It would be nice to know that we had that. It would be nice to get the USMCA signed with Mexico and Canada. They've been a year. Those countries have ratified it and are accepting of it. We need to get it passed to open those markets up. And how are you, uh, what are you hearing from other farmers? How are they feeling? What is the overall um, understanding of where, what the future holds? I would say most farmers want to get a trade deal done just for some certainty mm -hmm. with the way the last year's been with the weather and everything else that's affected us. Right. It'd be nice to have some certainty. Are people worried? Yes, I would say so. They're, they're very worried. How do you handle that? I mean, when you keep hearing this back and forth and getting yeses and nos and saying it's going to happen soon and then it's not going to happen until after the election and then we still have the USMCA that hasn't been signed and it still isn't at a committee. How do you handle that? It's just another day. <laughs> In reality, you, uh, you do what you can with what you have. So you, you try to do a good job of marketing when the mar market gives you a chance and, and you just move forward and make plans based on what you know today for tomorrow. So there was a new trade deal, another trade deal in Japan that um, was passed by their parliament. Uh, so is that kind of the way that things are going to have to go, the direction we're going to have to go, finding different markets, new markets aside from China to kind of at least just make do for now? Well, I think it, it's to make do for now, but it also is for the future. As we continue to produce more, crop, more soybeans and corn, we need to have markets for that crop and those emerging markets are huge. It'll be hard to, for somebody to take up the amount of right. product that China consumes. You know, one market to take that up. So if we can develop those new markets, 
it'll it won't completely offset it, but it'll help for the future. Just kind of chipping away yeah. at it a little bit at a time, and then, then you hope that a China trade deal happens. Yes. And then it then, it's, then we can get back to normal, and hopefully they'll continue to buy. Now the president has said if he needs to, he will give more aid to farmers this winter. What's your reaction to that? I would say that's probably a good thing with with where prices are at. We're at a, below a cost of production. So those trade payments are, are huge on our balance sheets. Bankruptcies are up 12%. Um, I don't like the payments. I don't want the payments. I would rather know that I can market my crop and there was at a profitable level because there was markets for that. But you'll take it if that's the only option? If, if that's the option to stay in business, yes. So as we head into the Iowa caucuses, we head into 2020, the general election. What is the general consensus of how President Trump is doing? I know you said that he's trying and he's working as much as he can, but I mean, to continually have tariffs, have be in the middle of a trade war, I mean, that's detrimental to our state's well-being. It's detrimental to our state's well-being, but it's also long-term, and farmers look at things from a long-term perspective. You know, we're, we want to make the, make the ground better than we got it, better than it was when we got it, and also leave it for our kids. So long term, we need to work these, these trade agreements out so they're free and reciprocal, not lopsided towards us. Okay, and looking ahead to the election, do you know, are you, do you feel like that's kind of the consensus that a lot of farmers have? I would think so. I, just based on what you hear, people are fair, farmers are fairly supportive of what President Trump has done so far. They would just like it to get done. For people sitting at home, we have about 30 seconds left, sitting at home on their couch thinking, gosh, the trade war doesn't affect me. It does. What, was your, what would your message be to them? The ag economy drives the rest of the economy. If farmers in small towns don't have money to spend, that trickles down to the school district, that trickles down to the local businesses, the car dealerships and all of that. Our economy in Iowa is driven by agriculture. We need good markets at profitable levels for us to survive. Randy Miller, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll take a short break, but coming up next, three people drop out of the race for the Democratic nominee for president. In as many days, we break down where, where the race stands now. Every morning, men, women, and children wake up hungry with no idea where their next meal will come from. Their stomach's empty, they go to bed in their car or on a friend's couch if they're lucky. At Hope Ministries, we feed and shelter hundreds of Iowans every day. We provide life recovery programs, counseling, and job readiness training. These men, women, and children wake up with hope instead of desperation. They go to sleep with full stomachs and full hearts, and you can help. Please visit HopeIowa.org and donate today. I know people love the Dish Remote. It's great. So why build in the Google Assistant? I mean, who really needs a TV remote that can turn the thermostat up? Change temperature to 72. The lights down. Lights. And still access their DVR. Play real. Actually, some people could absolutely use a remote like that. The new Dish Voice Remote. Dish, tuned in to you. If you feel stuck in the middle of the extremes in our politics and you are tired of the noise and the nonsense, you've got a home with me. I am someone that tells the truth. I don't make promises that I can't keep. I have people's back, and I believe that to win, you bring people with you, and that is how you govern as well. Because I don't want to be the president for half of America. I want to be the president for all of America. I'm Amy Klobuchar, and I approve this message. It's your voice and your vote. No matter your choice, decisions of politicians impact your everyday life. That's why Local 5 asks the tough questions. You guys knew about this last year. Why not fix the program last year? Uncovering the facts so you can make the right choices for you. How do you close the wealth gap in our country? From the state house to the Capitol, your legislators and candidates can affect real change. Know what their plans could mean for your family. Get local politics alerts straight to your phone. Opt in today for custom alerts on the We Are Iowa app. You're watching This Week in Iowa, Sunday morning talk focused on the political scene in Iowa. Welcome back.
back, everyone. Some major shakeups in the race for the Democratic nomination for president this week as three candidates drop out in as many days. We heard first from Joe Sestak, a former congressman from Pennsylvania, tweeting out Sunday that he was no longer running because he didn't want to continue to ask people for resources toward his campaign when he wasn't going to win. Then Monday, Montana Governor Steve Bullock drops out. Bullock, a Democrat who's won two gubernatorial elections in a deep red state, and that was his claim to why he was the right Dem to take on Trump, but he cited his inability to break through the top tier of candidates in such a crowded field. Then Tuesday, Kamala Harris drops out of the race. A one-time frontrunner in the presidential race, she had recently made major cuts in campaign staff, deciding to focus on winning Iowa. But this week, she abruptly announced that she is bowing out and running out of money and dropping out of the dropping down in the polls. And this perhaps is the most surprising development to date in the 2020 election. So then there were 15. As we approach the next debate on December 19th, six are still qualified for this debate. So those six are Joe Biden, Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, Bernie Sanders, Tom Steyer, and Elizabeth Warren. Now, Cory Booker, Tulsi Gabbard, and Andrew Yang all qualified for the last debate, but those three have not qualified for this debate yet, so we'll continue to follow that. This was all as of our taping on Thursday. We'll take a short break, everyone, and we'll be right back. Crossroad Shooting Sports is Central Iowa's premier indoor shooting range. Our state-of-the-art retail shop is an authorized dealer that has everything you need for concealed carry, home defense, and personal protection with over 200 guns in stock. Crossroad Shooting Sports, where responsibility and skill meet. For Local 5, most accurate isn't just a phrase, it's everything. The rain comes in late Friday night now, after midnight and into Saturday morning. Every commute to frost is possible early on today, so we may need that scraper handy. Every school day. That's four degrees feeling like sub-zero temperatures when you factor in the light breeze. Every forecast, accurate, so you can plan your day. 20 to 25 mile per hour, sustained winds gusting as high as 30. Local 5 weather, we are Iowa's most accurate forecast. A fertility doctor who fathered nearly 70 children is warning his secret offspring to keep quiet. He told me the world does not need to know. He betrayed my mom and my dad's trust. It's not just that he used his own specimen. On our mothers, he was known for using fresh specimens. He violated 70 women. Consequence, zero. All new Dr. Bill. Monday at 4 on Local 5. Tamron Hall, Clear Eyes Culture Connoisseur Karamo will talk about a new book he's written with his son about growing up, loving who you are. Plus, he wrote the best-selling memoir of all time, Tuesdays with Maury. Now, author Mitch Albom has another story to tell that changed his family's life forever. And she's one of the stars of the critically acclaimed drama Queen Sugar, Tina Lifford, will talk about her journey on the next Tamron Hall. Monday at 2 on Local 5. Crossroads Shooting Sports is Central Iowa's premier indoor shooting range. We feature a state-of-the-art retail shop, including full-service conference and training facilities. Our certified staff takes your safety, security, and education seriously. Crossroads Shooting Sports, where responsibility and skill meet. Thank you so much for joining us here on This Week in Iowa. And don't forget, if you cannot watch This Week in Iowa Sunday mornings at 9, you can take us on the road with you because we have a podcast. Just search This Week in Iowa on Spotify or wherever you find your podcasts. Have a great rest of your weekend.